everyone. My name is Wan Hee Seo. I'm one of the ID pharmacists at Mafi Cancer Center. So original schedule said uh, the infections and immune compromise the host, but I um, changed my topic uh, over the past several months. Um, so the updates on my college papers of 2016. So I attended the ASM 2016 this year in Boston, and the papers that are being presented here today uh, were well, one of the 15, like all of it was um, within, within the 15 top papers uh, selected for Mycology 2016. So out of those 15, I'm going to uh, present seven papers today, four in a clinical therapeutics, one in diagnostic, one in um, clinical mycology and epidemiology, and one in translational, which involves voriconazole pharmacokinetics. So the first paper uh, was published in New England Journal of Medicine. It's on dexamethasone in HIV-associated cryptococcal meningitis. So do we really need um, adjunctive dexamethasone therapy in this patient population? So this is a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial to determine the adjunctive dexamethasone would um, improve the survival in adult patients with HIV-associated cryptococcal meningitis. So the death uh, mortality rate is pretty high um, in this patient population and benefits of using glucocorticoid uh, in central nervous system infections has been shown. Um, it decreased the mortality from acute bacterial meningitis, also decreased mortality in a tuberculosis meningitis. Also, cryptococcal meningitis shares the same pathophysiology uh, with the TB meningitis. Um, so people have been using this, and then glucocorticoids are also recommended mandated in certain circumstances um, with mass effect or acute respiratory distress or when there is a high risk per IDSA guideline 2010 it is being it says may use gluco glucocorticoid in that situation and in a heavy um, burden disease area um, it's been used widely. Yeah, so the, in America, I guess it's a pretty rare disease. Um, so that's worldwide number? Yeah, it's a global number, oh, okay. yes. Uh, so in double-blind randomized placebo control trial, it's uh, 18 years old, and so the adult patient, over 13 hospitals in Africa and Asia, so included HIV with the clinical syndromes, uh, with the microbiology confirmation of the disease. Um, you can see the exclusion criteria, including already taking glucocorticoid or requiring um, steroid for existing other conditions. So lab was drawn and lumbar puncture was done, one day, one, three, seven, fourteen. Um, and CSF opening pressures and the culture were done on every sample. It was funded by the UK government. <laughs> Oops, sorry about that. Here you go. So the treatment wise, uh, they did uh, dexamethasone six weeks taper schedule, um, or uh, people had a placebo for six weeks per protocol. Um, this study was done where uh, flu cytosine was not available, so induction therapy included um, amphotericin B conventional with a fluconazole high dose and um, consolidation and maintenance um, as outlined here. Primary outcome was survival at week 10. And when they calculated the uh, sample size, 880 patients were needed for 80% power to detect the hazard ratio of 0.7 in favor of dexamethasone. <laughs> The trial uh, was suspended and recruitment began in February of 2013, but in um, one and a half a year later, the data review committee recommended uh, trial to be stopped because of a lot of harm um, seen in a dexamethasone arm, and trial was finally suspended in September of 2014 uh, with a final enrollment patient of 451. So this shows the primary and key secondary outcomes. So death by week didn't really show the difference because of the trial um, terminated earlier uh, before reaching. Oops. But the disability at six months with a good outcome was lower in dexamethasone or CSF fungal um, count clearance was slower in a dexamethasone arm, even though CSF opening pressure uh, decrease was greater in a dexamethasone arm. 
uh, the shoes are survival by the six months. There was no statistical difference. However, the examination arm um, runs below the placebo group for the survival. Especially when they break down the days of therapy, day 1 to 20, um, hazard ratio for death was 0.77. Uh, but as it goes to days 44 to 71, the hazard ratio for the examination group was 2.5. Um, this shows the adverse event by six months. So as you can see here, infection rate was higher, um, gastrointestinal disorder, renal or urinary disorder was higher in a dexamethasone group. And they say the renal disorder in dexamethasone group was really just by the sepsis that's caused by um, the infection itself, not really related to the dexamethasone. So adjunctive dexamethasone did not improve survival in HIV-associated cryptococcal meningitis from this study, and routine use is not justified. So it was pretty, pretty much a clear-cut study as well done. Um, the second study that I'm going to bring in is the pulmonary fungal infections in AML, time to revise a radiological diagnosis. So um, this was published in Mycosis 2016. So uh, the EORTC MSG, which refers to European Organization of Research and Treatment of Cancer, um, consensus uh, group of invasive fungal infection cooperative group, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease Mycosis Study Group. So it's called the EORTC MSG. They defined uh, what's proven versus probable or possible uh, fungal infection. Um, in 2008. They published that, and then proven infection involves the tissue microscopic visualization of the fungus plus the sterile site like blood or other sterile site culture positive. Uh, versus proven diagnosis, probable diagnosis are made when patients have a host factor like immune compromised patient with the presence of one of the three signs on the CT. So we have dense, well circumscribed lesions with or without halo signs or air crescent signs or the cavitary lesion, uh, plus the fungal isolation uh, from the respiratory samples or galactomannan or other like other um, beta D glucan test positives. So, just give you the idea, halo signs with a, a nodule around the ground glass, attenuation around it, and the air crescent sign shows like the cap, cavity like within the nodule. So these are the classic specific signs that they uh, included for the diagnosis of the probable disease. However, the application of a specific, this very specific but not very sensitive diagnostic radiological criteria may underdiagnose uh, pulmonary fungal infection and thus inclusion of a less specific criteria has been advocated previously. Um, as long as they have a proper microbiological evidence of fungal infection. So this study was to um, expand these experiences to a large homogeneous population. Here is um, high-risk AML patients. So the study was, um, was a single-center study in um, Rome, Italy, 26, 2006 to 2013. <laughs> included adult patient with a newly diagnosed AML who go through the um, intensive remission induction chemotherapy. So the baseline CT scan and leukemia diagnosis was done or the before the chemotherapy. Um, and posaconazole was introduced to the market April of 20, 2007, and that's when they um, started a profi. Before that, they didn't give any profi. And when patient, the neutropenic patient spikes the fever, they did um, baseline diagnostic workup, which included three blood culture and other microbiological tests or radiological exam if indicated. And if the patient's fever persists greater than four days or they had a relapsing fever after the defervescence of 48 hours, then they go up to like intensive diagnostic workup, included um, CT thorax and galactomannan serum for three days and three blood culture. So that's how they did it. Um, and this study included not the patient with presented with a uh, um, baseline CT positive for the fungal infection. Uh, these patients were baseline um, benign CT thorax, but then at the workup of BDWU or intensive workup, when they had a new pulmonary no nodules, they were included. 
uh, filamentous fungi or geotrichum capitatum. Um, so this is trichosporin. I guess it's renamed uh, from BAL or sputum culture uh, or included or and or galactomannan detection from serum or BAL. And, um, and they should not have any other microbiology evidence of other pathogens. So the single or multiple like sub-centimeter nodules, so we don't normally, um, per, per EORTC um, definition, these are not really um, classic fungal um, infection, but they call these pulmonary regions of sub-centimeter nodules um, a specific radiological findings, and there are two independent radiologists who are blinded to the treatment outcomes, uh, randomly evaluated all the CTs of these patients. And uh, for this, so there were group A and B. Group A was a probable PFI for uh, EURTC MSG criteria, and group B was the A, a specific. Um, radiological findings, but then on these patients, they recheck the CT scan after the four weeks, and that's T1 for possible evolution of the um, scan. So over these eight years, 265 patients with AML and intensive chemotherapy were included. Out of those 265, 138 patients with pulmonary infiltrate and 73 met the criteria and group A had 49 and group B had 24 patients. As you can see here, microbiologically, aspergillus was most common in both groups. And at the bottom, if you can see it, uh, the galactomannan from serum or BAL did not really differentiate between the group. Just give you an idea. So out of those 24 patients belong to the group B, uh, three patients died before, you know, we checked the CT scan in four weeks. So there are 21 patients. So at the very beginning, uh, they had not well circumscribed the consolidation, micronodules, ground glass, or trimbot, which are not like classic fungal pneumonia. But in four weeks, they evolved 11 patients. Yeah, 11 patients evolved with the macronodules or cavitary regions or, or halo signs uh, versus 10 people had no specific evolution. However, out of these 10 people, the first seven had um, no evolution. Three patients with diagnosis of a proven um, pulmonary mucormycosis had no evolution whatsoever. So no difference uh, between these 10 people versus um, 11 people who had evolution of the CT scan had no baseline um, characteristics were different, age, sex, previous antifungal prophylaxis or where they are at their disease state, galactomannan uh, were not different. So this study presents that maybe fungal disease may present in an atypical form in terms of radiological findings. What more specific radiological criteria are encouraged in like a clinical trials, however, in a clinical practice or epidemiological study, more sensitive studies maybe is needed. So authors are advocating for changing the EORTC definition to include less traditional CT findings uh, at the presence of microbiological evidence. At Moffitt, we do CT scan at baseline and every two weeks, so we catch pretty early on. But if that's not the common practice at some other institution, it's something that needs to keep in mind. Any comments on this paper? So moving on. Um, so Isavi Konazo is the newest addition um, of our antifungal. So this, um, this paper is a secure trial, phase three, um, double-blind randomized global center comparative group study to establish the non-inferiority of the isaviconazole as compared to boriconazole in invasive mold disease. Uh, was done in adult patients, America, Europe, and Middle East, Asia, Pacific regions over many years, 2007 through 2013. Um, included invasive mold disease, proven or probable or possible, they are all included, um, caused by aspergillus or other filamentous fungi, um, excluded a hepatic dysfunction or moderately um, in, renally impatient patient. Uh, 
uh, impaired patient. And isaviconazole was given standard dose 372, start with IV Q8 times 6, and then transition to IV or PO 372 daily, followed by the placebo, because voriconazole to match with the voriconazole is twice day dosing. For voriconazole, no therapeutic drug monitoring was done because therapeutic drug monitoring at the beginning of the study was not a standard of care. Um, so throughout the study, they just gave 200 milligram BID dosing and they did not do the uh, therapeutic monitoring. And max duration of the treatment was 84 days. Um, they assessed the clinical symptoms and physical findings at these um, intervals, day 3, 7, 14, up to um, day 84, and independent data review committee were uh, masked to the treatment allocation. Primary endpoint was all-cause mortality um, at day 42 in an uh, intention to treat population. They calculated um, sample size to be 255 patients in each arm for 80% power for 10% non-inferiority margin. It was funded by the drug manufacturer, Astellas and Basilia, um, and they were heavily involved in a study design, data collection and analysis, and writing of the report, and corresponding authors had a full access to the uh, data. Just give you an idea what is the most common pathogens um, that were causing the disease. Aspergillus species were number one, and there were some non aspergillus species, um, Rhizopus, Mucor species, Fusarium. And Galactomannan uh, positive uh, between Isaviconazole and Boriconazole group were not different. This shows the primary outcome. So at day 42, all-cause mortality between isaviconazole and boriconazole was not different. Uh, the 90% competency interval um, range from minus 7.8 to 5.7, so the upper end is less than 10%, so this was non-inferior to boriconazole. Um, the same result applied to day 84 or different population, either you only include a proven or probable infection or you look at it at only at the aspergillus patient um, or the possible infection, um, there was no difference between the two groups. This shows the safety outcomes. Uh, we just had a question about does isaviconazole cause rash. Yeah, yes, it does. So the rash and subcutaneous tissue disorders were caused by both, but it was lower in a isaviconazole group. The, in the red box were lower uh, statistically in a isaviconazole group. Eye disorder, like <coughs> decrease in vi visual acuity. There's no report of the hallucination from the isaviconazole. Hepatobiliary disorders were a little bit lower in a isaviconazole group, but was still possible. And drug discontinuation rate in isaviconazole group was 8% versus voriconazole was 14%. Social circumstances. I actually do not recall what they refer to. It's kind of funny. Yeah, it's zero and yeah. one. Maybe they couldn't afford the drug or something. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. yeah. But they both are very expensive. <laughs> but isaviconazole is a little bit more expensive. Yes. Uh, isaviconazole was shown to be non purea in this trial and was better tolerated compared to voriconazole. And there's no TDM done, so maybe voriconazole group had more toxicity. Maybe that's why they had to discontinue earlier, uh, which is unknown from this study. But definitely supports its use in aspergillus and other uh, fungal infection. Isaviconazole for mucormycosis. Uh, so this was just a single arm, not you know, control trial. It was an open label trial to assess the efficacy and safe, safety of isaviconazole for mucormycosis. And also, they did um, comparison case control analysis to compare the mortality from it um, um, with embisome using the historical data. So, the background um, mortality from mucormycosis greater than 90% if not treated, and as it Envisome was introduced, the mortality went down to 40%. However, it comes with nephrotoxicity and infusion-related reactions and all that. And posaconazole has been utilized as a salvage treatment. However, it's never been um, studied in a, a randomized trial or as a primary treatment for the mycosis. 
So vital study was the original study, uh, which was a single arm open label trial done in 33 centers worldwide, included invasive aspergillus with renal impairment and rare invasive fungal disease. And out of this rare invasive fungal disease, we picked uh, mucormycosis, and those data are presented here. So the, um, either you use the isaviconazole as a primary treatment, which meaning which means like four days or less of the antifungals previously, or intolerant patient to POSA or embezone, or refractory mycormycosis patients are all included in this analysis. There is an independent data review committee to establish the diagnosis using the same criteria, URTC mycosis study group criteria. Um, it was for adult patient, and um, isaviconazole is metabolized by CYP3A4, and it could be an inhibitor or the inducer of the CYP450, uh, and those patients were not included if they were on inhibitor or inducers. And matched case control analysis was using the historical data with the Fungiscope Global Emerging Fungal Infection Registry. So study drug is aviconazole, loading dose, 372 um, Q8 for six doses, uh, uh, then um, once daily dose. Uh, primary outcome was overall response uh, at day 42. A match to control analysis was done, again, using the um, historical registry data. Um, and the matching was based on the severe disease, which was defined by um, CNS or disseminated infection or hematological malignancy or surgical treatment or within seven days of antifungal treatment. Um, this was funded by the manufacturer, again, as Telas and Basilea of Isabiconazole. Shows the result. So the primary treatment group had 21 patients, refractory group had 11, intolerant group had 5. Um, most were not, um, it just was say, uh, it was just say mucorellis moles, but there was no further um, information on some of the isolates, and rhizophos was uh, the next, and the mucor species next. Um, and the median treatment duration for primary treatment group was 102, and the, as a total, it was 84. So they were treated for a long time, three months. Um, and 24, oh, 24 patients actually discontinued the um, isaviconazole, and there was 11 deaths and adverse events, um, relapse of the disease or bacteremia. I would not know why would you stop it, but they stopped it. Overall response in vital studies um, with the mucormycosis. So if you look at the um, day four, day 42, there's no complete response, but partial and stable disease um, combined was 54% of the population. At day 84, um, there was some um, complete response and partial and stable combined to 49%. So you can see that the effect continued over the three months. Looking at the matched case control analysis, so 33 patients were matched to the 21 uh, vital patients from the registry. And you can see that uh, there was more severe disease in the isaviconazole group than the amphotericin B group. Um, and median treatment duration was kind of striking to me. Isaviconazole group was um, treated for 102 days versus amphotericin B group. Um, was 18 days, but if it was followed by the posaconazole, then was 34 days. So does, I'm not sure if that means if the amphotericin B group um, did way better than the isaviconazole, or they just didn't tolerate the drug and they had to stop. But um, if you just look at the mortality data, the crude mortality on day two, day 42 was not different between the two groups, and on the graphically, the blue, blue line is the amphotericin, which runs a little bit lower uh, in terms of survival compared to the isaviconazole. So um, in conclusion, the study showed the activity of isaviconazole even as a primary treatment. Uh, at MAFI, we normally when patients suspected to have mucormycosis, we go to directly to amphotericin. Uh, but in this study showing that as a primary treatment had a pretty good um, 
activity as a primary therapy, 32%, or salvage therapy, 36%. And this was pretty comparable to the amphotericin historical data. Favorable tolerability of isabiconazole may have added to the def um, difference in duration and differential um, treatment effect on specific fungal species were not assessed in this study. Any comments on this study? I, I think it's safe to say that the, the, the biggest differential between isabiconazole and amphotericin products in terms of duration of treatment is most certainly due to tolerability. Yes. So we saw that in the um, loraconazole versus amphotericin trial. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the reason, I suspect the reason that they weren't they didn't actually have arm in this one was specifically because of the toxicity concern and the fact that ambisome is ambisome and liposome amphotericin is not FDA approved for a first line treatment of eucromycosis either. Mm -hmm. So you know, they, if they were going for an NDA, they, had, they would have had to compare it to conventional amphotericin immediately. Yeah. Yeah, so in terms of treatment duration, I think there is no question about, you know, isabiconazole can be used longer than ambisome, but what, are you, what agent you're going to do um, use at the very first diagnosis is the question that this is trying to answer. Um, and based on this, there's no difference, so maybe we can <laughs> go to the Crescemba versus ambisome. Uh, and then there is a big question about should we do the combination antifungal or is one agent as good as the combination therapy? This is the big debate. And um, so this study was published in um, Clinical Mic Microbiology and Infection this year, and it's a retrospective study um, try to answer this question. So it's a retrospective review of patients treated for mucormycosis at a single center, MD Anderson, uh, over two decades. So since 1994 through 2014, they include adult patients who met EORTC MSG definition again for proven and probable infection only. They excluded the patient with solid tumor or the possible mucormycosis or if they had a mixed fungal infection or died too early. Um, in initial treatment, um, uh, was defined as any mucoralis active antifungal started within the first seven days uh, from the baseline. Monotherapy was either ambisome, uh, lipodromal amphotericin B, or postaconazole in their institution. And combination therapy um, consisted with um, any combination of ambisome, echinocandines, or the posaconazole. And they divided the analysis into two different decades because of the introduction of posaconazole around 2004. So um, you can see the time frame there. Um, primary outcome was early survival at six weeks after the treatment initiation, and they did calculate the propensity score for receiving the combination therapy like diabetes, um, prior history of HSCT, uh, the stem cell transplant, um, for example. And the patients were divided into low and the high risk mortality based on their cutoff score they determined by the ROC analysis. Then the mortality was recalculated based on this um, risk um, level. The patient characteristics, characteristics are shown here. There were 74 uh, proven and 32 probable mucormycosis patients over the two decades at that center. And there were 47 patients in a monotherapy group and combination therapy had a 59 patient. Their baseline characteristics were pretty similar in terms of neutropenia at diagnosis, neutrophil recovery, um, Type of infection, either localized or sinopulmonary disseminated, pretty similar. Surgical intervention was similar. And the only thing that was different between the group was um, the later decade of the study, 2005 to 2014, as we have more data, uh, more agents available, there are more cases of combination therapy, and that was the only difference. And six week mortality, 12 week mortality, time to death was pretty. Uh, similar, 47 versus 46 days. Predictors of the outcome at six weeks, um, these are the only the variables that had uh, statistically significant um, 
difference between the dead and the alive patients. So active primary disease was a key factor. Neutropenia, lymphopenia, ICU, um, at diagnosis, Apache 2 score, um, disseminated infections. If they have these, um, you likely to die by six weeks. The ones in color, lymphopenia, ICU, at diagnosis, and localized infections, um, they were also significant in a multivariate analysis, and localized infection was definitely favor for the survival. And as you can see, the regimen-wise, embizome and posaconazole um, used commonly, um, as well as um, embizome with caspopungin uh, versus the three-drug combination. This shows the propensity score of just survival curves. So uh, the p-value here is 0 0.71. Monotherapy is a solid line, goes below the combination treatment, but there is no statistical difference. If they um, divide the patient group to low and the high risk, so the one, uh, one right, oops, the one right here is a high, uh, that's the survival. So that's a low risk group and that's a high risk group. So for the low risk group, actually the monotherapy is the solid line so runs um, higher even though there's no statistical difference. The combination group though in a high risk, there's no statistical difference, but it runs low when you have the combination therapy. How did they determine who was low and who was high risk? So they did, um, they did some calculation, plug in all the information, and then they did the ROC analysis, and they determined like number 33 to be the cutoff, and if they are over 33, it was high risk. Um, so there are more details in the actual paper. Yeah. So in this single center retrospective study, there's no early mortality benefit was shown by using the combination therapy. And it was interesting to see the univariate analysis and multivariate analysis. Um, you know, they did identify the well-known risk factors for um, the, the mortality. Uh, more combination therapy was used definitely as uh, more agents are available. And um, as I pointed earlier, in a high-risk patient, uh, if you use the combination, there is no statistical difference, but I see that a little bit of separation of the lines. So if you have more patients in that group, you may see the difference. So the further studies um, needed with a large number of patients included. Any questions on this paper? Uh, next, we're going to go to the epidemiology of echinocandid non-susceptible candida glabrata bacteremia. This hasn't been an issue at MAFID, but is that an issue in VA at all? Okay. But there have been an increased reports of bacteremia caused by echinocandid and multidrug resistance um, candida species, and the mo majority of it is the candida glabrata. The study was to describe the epidemiology of echinocandid non-susceptible um, candida glabrata bacteremia. So this was part of the CDC's surveillance um, from 2008, 2008 through 2014 in four large cities in the United States, Atlanta, Baltimore, Tri-County region of Portland, um, and Knox County in Tennessee. Um, all um, isolates were sent to CDC for uh, molecular identification for the speciation and susceptibility done by broth microdilution. FKS mutation, uh, which involves the um, site of action of the echinocandins, 1,3-beta-glucan uh, synthase, um, was anal analyzed on the isolates with a elevated MIC, and C. glabrata um, isolates were categorized as susceptible intermediate resistance per CLSI breakpoint. So the first top graph, as you can see, um, over the six years, the general overall um, non-susceptibility isolate rate was 4.2 and then increased to 7.8. But as you can see, different, different regions have really different trend and there's a lot of variability. The bottom graph also shows the trend over the time. Um, not over the time, trend um, between the different hospitals. So as you can see, uh, some have no non-susceptible, which is a darker box, um, have no non-susceptible isolates. So the non-susceptible isolates were heavily um, concentrated in three teaching academic hospitals in this study. 
uh, this shows the risk factors, uh, which is pretty well known for us. Hospitalization within 90 days, previous candidemia, prior echinocandin use, um, use of TPN, central venous catheter. And if you look at the FKS mutation, uh, which they are all like same, um, they all had an increased risk ratio uh, that paralleled with the uh, phenotype. Um, of non-susceptibility to echinocandins, except the previous candidemia, uh, which the adjusted odd ratio was 1.6, but uh, the 95% confidence interval start from 0.6, it crosses the one, so it was the only thing that was different. So of note, 48% non-susceptible um, isolate actually had no prior echinocandin or um, the candidemia, and 37% of the FKS mutation had no prior echinocandin or candidemia either. And if they had none of the uh, susceptible or intermediate isolate actually had FKS mutation, but if you um, have non-susceptible isolate, only 50% of the patient had FKS mutation, which implies there is a different mechanism of mutation. So the surveillance study demonstrate increasing echinocandin trend, um, non-susceptible isolates in the large area, and there is a large variation among the hospitals. Um, of note, the, the patient without the prior exposure to echinocandin or candidemia or fluconazole had um, echinocandin non-susceptible isolate raised the possibility of this uh, mutation going around transmitted within the hospital community. I'm sorry if I missed this myself. I have to step out for a moment. But did they look at the uh, like days, overall days of, of a kind of candidate therapy between the different institutions to see whether whether they saw more cases in this mm. in centers with higher candidate use mm. in general? Yeah, that was not stated in the paper, but they stated that most of the non susceptible isolates were from three. Um, like greater than 80% was from the three academic hospital, teaching hospital. But it didn't really say the days of echinocandine. But I think it's significant because there's no exposure, you can still have this. And um, once your hospital has it, you have a high likelihood of having, having it more, I guess. Um, my final paper I have is uh, published in Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy on voriconazole pharmacokinetics. So voriconazole TDM has been routinely done nowadays as a standard of care for the treatment of established fungal infection. However, do we need to monitor the level um, when we are using it as a prophylaxis? So um, in this study, they try to use it in um, stem cell transplant. Um, so uh, this was a PK pharmacokinetic dynamic analysis performed as a sub-study of a large phase three clinical trial, uh, which compared efficacy of fluconazole and voriconazole for patients with a stem cell transplant. And out of 305 patients who received the voriconazole, pharmacokinetic data were available only for 187 adult patients. And they exclude the pediatric because pediatric voriconazole PK is supposedly really different than the adult patient. They use a standard dose of 200 milligram PO or IV Q12 without the loading dose. And the sampling was done on day 14 plus and day 28. Uh, and there were a total of 213 samples available. Um, because it's a human being, you can't really describe the behave uh, like a pharmacokinetics of the drug by sampling it very often from one individual. So they do use the population pharmacokinetic models here. And 213 samples were done. Um, and so they separated the time of sampling from zero to six hour post dose. Um, and there were 60% uh, of the sample from that time frame. And then the rest come from the middle time point, like 6 to 12 hour, and then uh, 12 to 18 hour post-dose were 10% of the sample drawn from that time period. Oops. Uh, and then they used the already published population pharmacokinetic model. Um, so they didn't have 
a lot, hold a lot of samples, uh, but they also had um, already published the pharmacokinetic model. And this model was um, done in a 21 healthy volunteers with a 43 proven or probable invasive aspergillus infection. So this is different than um, our population, which we are using the voriconazole for the prophylaxis. So this PK model was drawn from either healthy volunteer or when you are using the voriconazole as a treatment. But they used that data to predict um, concent mean concentration and AUC um, of each patient um, on this population. They use the same criteria, URTC, MSG criteria for invasive fungal infection, and estimation of the C mean, um, minimum concentration and AUC was again done using that population PK model, rather than using their own raw data. So out of 187 patients, there was only 10 patients with proven or probable um, presumptive invasive fungal disease, which is very low number um, of actual infection breakthrough. And out of that 10, uh, five patients had a breakthrough infection after the boriconazole was discontinued because they only continue up to 100 days per protocol. And um, so they only included five patients in this analysis, so the very small number of patients. So this shows the individually observed versus uh, predicted concentration. So as you can see here, the dotted line is the line of unity. So which you, if you are there, that means um, your predicted concentration is your observed concentration. And this is the actual um, model that predict um, predicted concentration versus observed. So there is a little separation and R square is 0.77 and this is for the individually. So when you are uh, interpreting the data for the population pharmacokinetics, they do put out this type of uh, graph and you will see population observed versus predicted concentration. Um, that just predicts the whole as a whole population, but these data are adjusted for each patient's characteristics and using their data from their raw samples and plus their prior knowledge of, uh, oh, okay, this drug may behave this way in our body using the prior pharmacokinetic models. So these are more um, adjusted for individual basis and normally um, R square value um, greater than 0.8 um, considered to be good. And so this is not really too good, but it is reasonable, 0.77. So drug exposure and efficacy um, of prophylaxis, if you look at the C-mean or AUC, they were not um, statistically significantly um, related to the outcome of breakthrough infection, which is not surprising when you have this little number of patients. <laughs> so in this question, there are no observed um, difference um, between the drug exposure and the breakthrough infection. However, when they did a power calculation at the back end, they actually needed like 1,700 patients in boriconazole arm only, which is way, way less. So uh, there's a further speculation though, uh, is the boriconazole 200 BID just so good in terms of it? Um, prophylaxing, um, preventing the infection. So you see, you are already seeing the near maximal effect, therefore you don't see any difference. Or is that just underpowered? Or is there any protocol violation? Uh, or the PK data, because it was drawn from the other pa patient population's PK data that was modeled and they predicted their C-mean and AUC from that data was that imprecise. So it has a lot of questions in there, but I would just take it as a you know, something back of your head, but it's still the question, either we need to do TDM for the prophylaxis or not, it's not answered through this study.